advocating uh, that their goal is a world culture, a world religion, a world government. And the second thing is they all base it on evolution, without exception. Uh, the, the, the patron saint of the New Age movement is the Je Jesuit priest, Taylor de Chardin. The reason I say that is because Marilyn Ferguson, who wrote the, sort of the Bible, the Aquarian Conspiracy of the New Age movement, took a poll among all the leaders of the New Age movement, asking them who was most influential in their thinking and leading them to their position. And the, by far the most of them said de Chardin. Well, what was his view? Here's what he says in his book, The Phenomenon of Man. Is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It's much more. It's a general condition to which all theories, all systems, all hypotheses must bow, in which they must satisfy henceforward if they're to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lines of thought must follow. Evolution to him is God. Only it's not a personal God. It's a God of nature. It's a pantheistic God. And, of course, the New Age orbit generally is a restoration of ancient pantheism. It sounds a little bit maybe more spiritual to say well, God is everywhere, that's pantheism, all God, than to say atheism, which means no God. Yeah, but you see, if, if, if God is really everywhere in general, then he's nowhere in particular, and there's really therefore no difference in terms of any practicality in terms of, of God's existence and, and meaning. So it's a little different, but it's uh, it's basically the same. Well, people would say, well, yeah, but wasn't wasn't they Chardin a priest? Didn't he believe in the in in Christ? Yeah, he did. Let me read what he said about Jesus Christ. He said, "It is Christ in very truth who saves." But then we must immediately add that at the same time, it is Christ who is saved by evolution. Evolution is not only the creator but also the savior. And now that we understand past evolution, therefore we can control future evolution. And as the New Humanist Manifesto says in 1973, no deity will save us, we will save ourselves. Robert Muller, who was associate, I mentioned that Julian Huxley was the founder, first director of UNESCO, but of the United Nations Organization as a whole, a very recent assistant secretary general was Robert Muller, who's one of the leaders of the New Age movement, and he says the most fundamental thing we can do today is to believe in evolution. The whole system is based on evolution. Well, I want to get a little into the history of evolution, too. The impact of it today is worldwide and devastatingly harmful everywhere. I don't think you can find a single good product that's come out of evolutionary philosophy. It hasn't produced any, any scientific discoveries. You can read the annual list of the hundred outstanding discoveries of science in the previous year. They don't ever have anything to do with evolution. They have medical advances and... Uh, advances in physics and so forth, but none of them deal with evolution. Evolutionary theory doesn't produce anything good in science, and yet it's considered to be the basic premise in science here in California now. Amazing development. Well, where, where did all this come from? Now, Darwin, people think, well, it came from Charles Darwin, Origin of Species. Yes, Darwin was a catalyst that was tremendously influential back in his day and our day. He just really changed the world in a very real way. And yet, he didn't begin evolution. As a matter of fact, he didn't even discover the idea of natural selection. In my research for, for the book, whatever that amounted to, I found that at least 11 men had published treatises advocating natural selection before Charles Darwin. Uh, his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin, did before Charles was even born. And Benjamin Franklin advocated natural selection, and various others did. But the most influential was a man by the name of Alfred Russell Wallace, I must tell you a little about him because it does seem more than coincidental at the same time that modern Darwinian evolution came to the fore back in the mid-19th century, that was also the time when ancient witchcraft and spiritism and occultism were being revived in the Western world. It had always been prominent in the world of pantheism and the other nations, the ethnic religions of the world. But in the Western world, spiritism and occultism began to be revived about the same time as evolution. And I mentioned that there's a long war been going on between the devil and, and, and God. And it does seem like that because of the great religious revivals and other things that have been taking place and the Christian worldview that dominated Victorian England to a degree in America at the founding of our nation and so forth, that there had to be some special steps taken maybe. And it is significant, I think, that the three men who've been, uh, to whom it's been attributed the, most, the greatest influence on modern thought one in the field of psychology and human relationships, Sigmund Freud, the other in the field of economics and political science, Karl Marx, and then in the field of science, natural science, Charles Darwin, uh, 
all these three men seemed to have had some strange occult influences behind what they were doing. You might read Paul Vitch's book, recent book called, I think it's Sigmund Freud and His Christian Unconscious. And Dr. Vitz, who's certainly a fine scholar, gives an abundance of evidence that Sigmund Freud, who most people think was an atheist, but really was a pantheist, based his system pretty much on the recapitulation theory, which I've just mentioned. And he thinks people's hang-ups are because they haven't evolved far enough, and so therefore they can be treated by psychoanalysis. Anyway, he, he said he was preoccupied with things like the devil and the antichrist and demonism and so forth, and then he raises, uh, presents some rather significant evidence that uh, Freud maybe made a Faustian pact with the devil. And the same thing has been shown to be true of Karl Marx by Richard Wormbrand in, in his book Marx and Satan. Karl Marx was not just an atheist like we tend to think. He was a pantheist. He was a professing Christian through high school. He wrote a rather interesting essay that I saw in Christianity Today quite a number of years ago now on uh, abiding in Christ. And he, it sounded just like a, a spiritual sort of a testimony from someone who was a Christian and talked how important it was to abide in Christ. But shortly after that, he also seems to have made some kind of a Faustian pact with the devil. And then he says, my goal is to destroy him who reigns above, in one of his poems. And Wormbrun make, makes a pretty strong case for the fact that Marx was a Satanist. And as far as Darwin was concerned, he wasn't that. He was an atheist, although there is some evidence now that just toward the end of his life, his recent book by Dr. Croft called Darwin, Life and Death, there in England, that indicates that Darwin had a change of thought or heart to a degree just before he died. I didn't think so until I read Croft's book, but uh, there may be something to that. But at any rate, up until very near the time of his death, he was an atheist. He sometimes wavered between being an atheist and agnostic, but at any rate, he rejected Christianity and rejected the Bible, rejected creation. And for a long time, you know, he was developing his theory of natural selection ever since he returned from the voyage on the beacon and was influenced then by Charles Lyell particularly to try to develop this theory. Uh, he had been working on it for some 20 years there in England, but he was afraid to publish it. He just didn't think he had the evidence strong enough, and he, was keep, he kept looking for more. And he, had a, he was going to publish a great big tome on natural selection. And all of a sudden, something stimulated him to, to condense it down quickly and get his book out because he was afraid he was going to be anticipated by Alfred Russell Wallace. Now, Wallace is an interesting person. He was an anarchist, among other things, and he was a spiritualist. In fact, he was one of the leaders in the spiritualist or spiritist revival in England at the time. He wrote books on the scientific evidence for spiritism, and he believed that you could communicate with the spirits and so on just like modern New Age people believe you can do this uh, through the, what they call channeling. And furthermore, he had spent many, many years in the jungles working with animist tribes who also did this. And he thought very highly of these people. He was not like Darwin, who thought these were primitive people just a little above the apes. He thought very highly of them because he worked with them. He knew they were human beings. In fact, he wouldn't go along with Darwin and with the idea that man's soul had evolved. He believed that it was some sort of a pantheistic cosmic consciousness that led to man's soul. At any rate... He knew about the communication with spirits, both in his jungle tribes, in which he spent many years, and through his studies in, in England. And this man, who had never had much opportunity to associate with the scientists of England, he had met Darwin and Lyell, but only very briefly, and he knew that they were also interested in the origin of species. But let me read his testimony in a book that he wrote called The Wonderful Century. He says, I was then, this was in 1858, living at Ternate in the Moluccas, and was suffering from a rather severe attack of intermittent fever which prostrated me every day during the cold and succeeding hot fits. During one of these fits, while again considering the problem of the origin of species, something led me to think of Malthus' essay on population. And Malthus talked about the survival of the fittest in human populations, and he had been quite influential in Darwin's thinking, too. And then he goes on to say, Then it suddenly flashed upon me that this self-acting process would necessarily improve the race, because in every generation the inferior would inevitably be killed off and the superior would remain, that is, the fittest would survive. Then at once I seemed to see the whole effect of this. And he goes on and says, The whole method of species modification became clear to me, and in the two hours of my fit I had thought out all the main points of the theory. That same evening I sketched out the draft of a paper, and in the two succeeding evenings I wrote it out and sent it by the next post to Mr. Darwin. Uh, Darwin, when he got this, was just astounded because he told his friend Lyell 
that here Wallace had anticipated everything that he had been putting 20 years into in his research for his big book. So they had to come out with a book right away in order to have the priority. And so he never did publish his big book and probably never would have published at all had it not been for Wallace sitting in this uh, information that he had found the theory not in 20 years of research among the leading scientists in England, but in two hours of a pit in Malaysia jungles. Loren Isley, the great historian of science, in his article on Wallace, says this, A man pursuing birds of paradise in a remote jungle did not yet know that he had forced the world's most reluctant author to disgorge his hoarded volume, or that the whole of Western thought was about to be swung into a new channel because a man in a fever had felt a moment of strange radiance. Well, you can make what you want out of that. I'm inclined to think there's more than meets the eye there. <laughs> and uh, this is just one battle, maybe, in a long war. But then, of course, neither Wallace nor Darwin originated evolution. And boy, I'm trying to condense the whole history of the world into 45 minutes. And my 45 minutes is just about up. But I did, you know, I did get started two or three minutes late. So let me have just a... <laughs> As you go back before Darwin and his grandfather Erasmus and other leading evolutionists, you find all sorts of strange influences being brought to bear on In fact, my chapter in the book calls this the dark nursery of Darwinism, revolutionism and all sorts of things happening. But anyway, uh, before Lamarck and the German rationalist philosophers and the French philosophers like uh, not only Lamarck but others before him, they had all been influenced very much by a system called the Great Chain of Being. Maybe you've heard of that. Uh, maybe you haven't. It's not taught much anymore. But the idea of the great chain of being was that there's a continual link between all, all, all orders of reality in the cosmos. It's not a biblical concept, but it does have sort of a, of a religious flavor to it. It starts out with the divine essence, whatever that may be. Now, some of the medieval religionists put that uh, in, into the form of, of a theological with God system. But uh, no, that wasn't the way it started out. It's just the divine essence of nature. But then that dis descended in a continuous link through the spirit world, angels, demons, whatever other spirits there might have been, finally down to human beings, the highest races of human beings, then down to the lower races, then to the great apes, then down to the other animals, finally down to the insects, and then to the non-living things, and finally down to the elementary, elementary particles. And the idea was a, there was a chain of being in which there were no missing links, and it was up to the philosophers to find out all the missing links because they were there somewhere. There's a great chain of being from the highest to the lowest in the world. Now, that concept of a great chain of being was held by Lamarck and the other early evolutionists and to a degree by Darwin. And, of course, all they had to do was invert it and put a time scale on it, and we have the evolutionary system. And that chain of being was really the basis for the initial studies before Darwin of comparative anatomy and comparative embryology. The idea there was that everything had to go through, had to exhibit this uh, chain from simple to complex or complex to simple, whichever way you want to look at it. So the development of the embryo was from very simple to complex. The comparative anatomy had to be based on the idea of studying the simplest organisms on up to the, to the top. And finally, when it came time to, to develop a geological time scale, that was done because there's no place in the world where the standard geological column is ever found except in the textbook. So it was developed by uh, knowing that the, that the simple forms of life had to be early in the chain of being and the more complex forms of life later. And that was just sort of imposed on the study of paleontology and then finally built up into our standard time scale. So the recapitulation theory, the geological column, uh, the idea of races being uh, inferior and superior and so forth, and the idea of human beings developing in, and not having fully developed and therefore still having psychological hang-ups, all of these things are based on this idea of the great chain of being. And where did that come from? That didn't come from the Bible, obviously. It came from the ancient philosophers, probably from Plato, but it became more prominently expressed among the Neoplatonists, the Plotinus and others, uh, after the time of Christ. And here I don't have time at all, but philosophy, that had its renaissance during the renaissance period. And it was ancient Greek philosophy with the chain of being and the idea of evolution, because all of these ancient Greek philosophers, without exception, were non-creationists. They did not believe there was a personal creator God who created the universe. They all believed that the universe was the ultimate reality again, and uh, gradually expressed itself in terms of the chain of being. Now, uh, Paul dealt with some of them. You remember about the Epicureans and the Stoics in the Acts chapter 7.